Um, we thank God for today. Our God has always been wonderful. He has always been gracious. Praise the Lord once again. This morning, uh, I want to welcome you because today also happens to be a special day in the Christian calendar. Today is Palm Sunday. Uh, we thank God that uh, our eyes are beholding another one. God has been gracious to us. Uh, he has added another year to each and every one of us. Some of us have celebrated our birthdays already. Some are yet to do this. And by the grace of God, we shall all be present to celebrate it in Jesus' name. Today we are celebrating Palm Sunday. So when we look at our video this morning, the person that spoke to us spoke about Palm Sunday, the importance of it. It's a day of triumph for Christ, for the, for the Christ, his followers. And they showed their, 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 their happiness by taking off their clothes, putting it on the ground, they let their Lord, our Lord sit on a donkey and they sang praises to his name. The praises were so loud that it worries the elders, the Sandendrins and the people in the temple that they said, Jesus, don't you hear what these people are saying? Quieting them down. And Jesus told them, you don't even know what you are talking about. Even if these very ones will quiet down, the very stones shall cry out. It was a day of fulfillment of a prophecy that he will ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Behold your Lord, very meek, he rides upon a donkey, the foal of an ark. Father, we thank you for what you have done for us. You will always remain in our love, even forevermore, in Jesus' name. This morning, I want to talk to you not about Palm Sunday, but I want to talk to you about a topic which I have chosen, which God has put in my heart to talk to you about. So this morning, I want to talk about God can and God will make a way where there seems to be no way. God can and God will make a way for you and for me where there seems to be no way. Our God is a God that can do all things, a God of all possibilities. And he can do it. He has done it before. He's doing it. And he will do it for you in Jesus' name. Um, the lesson that was the Bible reading this morning was taken from 2 Kings chapter 7, verses 1 to 20. And it's the majority of what we want to discuss this morning. And secondly, I want you to take time to read the first seven chapters of Second Kings. When you read the seven chapters of Second Kings, you will see that our God is indeed a great God and a wonderful God and a caring God. Now, when we take Second Kings chapter seven, verses one to 20, there are basically two things I want to bring out first of all before I go into exposing other things to you. Now, that passage that we read this morning, and I want you to read it again, teaches two things. Number one, the passage itself is an historical parable. A parable is an heavenly story, or it's an earthly story that has heavenly spiritual meaning. And the book, that particular book, is an historical Parable. We call it historical parable because it actually happens. It wasn't a fable. It wasn't a story. It's an actual history. That's why we call it historical. It's a parable because it has. It is an earthly story that has heavenly spiritual meaning. I'm going to expound on that. And the second part of it is that it is a book that is a good book of evangelism. It gives us a very important lesson about what evangelism is and what evangelism should be. I had one more point that the book also, I'm going to use it this morning to teach you about how God uses numbers. The numbers that you find in the Bible are not arbitrary. 
They are real numbers. They are historical numbers. But when God uses numbers, he uses numbers because of their meaning. In that particular passage, we saw the number one, we saw the number two, we saw the, five, the number five of horses, we saw the, num the number four of lepers, and so forth and so on. Now, the number one, when you ever you see it in the Bible, stands for oneness. It stands for the unity of God. God is one God. Here, O Christians, the Lord our God is one God. But alas, he shows himself to us in three persons. So that's why we say three in one God or a triune God. So our God is one God. The oneness stands for the unity that is God. We don't have two gods. We have only one God. When we say the number two in the Bible, the number two stands for family. Anytime you see the number two, go and look very closely. You will see it has to do with family. When you see the number four, the number four is a double two. When you have double two, it means that whatever is going to happen, God has determined it and it's going to happen real soon. Then you see the number five. The number five stands for two things. It's either standing for the grace of God or it's standing for the judgment of God. Hallelujah. Then you see the number six. The number six again stands for man. Man was created on the six days. Anytime you come across the number six in the Bible, it has to do with man. And also don't forget what the Bible says that the number was the number of man and the number is 666. We will not have 666 as our numbers in Jesus' name. Our own, what will be put on our head, on our forehead, on the, on the palms of our hand, will be the blood of Jesus. And the name that nobody knows but only God knows and has given it already to us in Jesus' name. Then you come across the number seven. The number seven stands for the perfection of God. Did I talk about three? The number three stands for the, 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 uh, uh, the it stands to some extent for the perfection of God or the, the, the triuneness of God and for the purpose of God. When you see the number God, uh, three, it means God is ready and has a purpose for that particular thing. The number seven stands for the perfection of God. You see it, the seven holy candles, the seven spirits of God, and so forth and God. Then you go to the number 10. The number 10 stands for the completeness of what God is about to do. Then you come across the number 12. The number 12 is an administration number. It stands for the fulfillment or the, the total gathering of what God wants to do. The 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 uh, uh, this, this, uh, the, uh, apostles and so forth and so on. Then we come across the number 13. The number 13 is a number of rebellion. Wherever you come across the number 13, there is a rebellion in sight within that, within that number. Then I'll go to number 40. The number 40 stands for testing and for trial. 40 days of testing in the wilderness and so forth and so on. Now the second lesson about that story is that the story is the story of evangelism. Remember the two lepers. They went into the Assyrian camp where they were in despair. They have a problem. Number one, people, are, people don't want them in the city because a leper cannot dwell among the people. So therefore, they, 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 they are kept separately. So whenever they are coming and they see people, they inform the people that they are lepers so that people can move away from them. Because leprosy was a very bad disease and very contagious. You can't live among people if you do that. If you, if you have it, we will not have it in the name of Jesus. Now, but the other problem was that if you go earlier into chapter 4 of Second Kings, you'll find out that there was a problem in Israel. Israel had been besieged and people have been closed in. They can't find food. There was famine in Israel. It got to the state that one day when the king was coming, there were two women that were, they, 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 they addressed the king. So they, they, they asked the king, the king said, well, I myself am in the same problem that you have. 
So I don't have a winery, and there's no way I can give you food. But let me listen to you. What do you want to say? And the woman complained to God that we are two women. So we agreed to kill the two women. One of the, they, they agreed to kill their children, their two sons, so that they can have something to eat. So on one day, they killed one. So they, the two of them enjoyed it. We will not get into that kind of problem in the name of Jesus. Then the second day, when they have to kill the other one, the other one took, took her own son and hide it so that they will not kill it. And that was the complaint to the king. That one shows us how dire in need the people of Israel were. They were besieged. They can't come out because their Syrian soldiers were outside. So they have to stay inside. And food, there was no food in the, in, 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 inside. Even the animals cannot be fed. Now there was a lot of problems. Now these two lepers, said, well, look, we are in a dilemma. We can't go in, we can't go out. There is no food. If we don't eat, we are going to die. If we go to the Assyrian camp, they will kill us. If we stay here, we will die. So let us go to the Assyrian camp. If we will die, we will die. And they went in. And what happened? God has created a problem for the Assyrians. They hear the rumors of horses, and they thought, the Israelites have employed the services of the Egyptians. So they ran away, leaving everything behind. So when these two lepers entered into the camp, they found food, yam yam. They found clothes. They found all kinds of things. They took all their hearts can. They eat all they can eat. They carry and hide somewhere. Then one of them told the other, this thing that we are doing is not good. The people of God are inside. They are starving, yet all these things are here. We've taken what we can. It is not a good thing if you keep quiet. So they went in and let them know what happened. How is it related to evangelism? It's the same. We have been fed by the word of God, those of us who have come to know Christ and believed. We know Christ. We have been given the opportunity to be saved. And we are saved already. Should we then sit down and just enjoy the salvation alone while the rest of the world is out there and perishing for lack of the word of God? As it stands, we are the two lepers. We have seen the glory of God. We have enjoyed the grace of God. Must we keep it quiet to ourselves? If you do that, it is not a good thing. So therefore, we are given the opportunity to go out there and talk to every, everybody in every nation that they too may hear the word of God and come to the benefits of it. It is a food that we can't eat alone. God has provided enough grace that if the whole world will turn around and believe in Jesus Christ, we can all be saved and there will still be many left. Our God is a God of multiplication. It has enough grace to save everybody, but a lot have not had. And every day we say, Christ has not come. And we gave mockers the opportunity to say Christ will not come. Christ has not come because we have not done our work diligently enough for him to come. It is not the pleasure of God that any should perish, but that everyone should come to the knowledge of understanding have faith and be saved. Faith does not come unless by hearing, and the hearing is the hearing of the word of God. The story that we have in 2 Kings chapter 7 shows us that it is not good to keep salvation alone to ourselves. We must endeavor to find whatever means that is necessary that we can use to tell others the good things that God has done for us. Christ died not for me alone, not for you alone, but for everybody. And the grace has been given. For the Bible says that God loves the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever will believe in him will not perish but shall receive everlasting life. And Jesus, Jesus said also in the Bible, if you believe in me, you will not die. And even if you are dead, 
you will rise again. If you believe that, then go out and begin to evangelize to others. So that is the second part of that story that I want us to understand. Now, concerning the passage or the, the topic, God will, God will make a way where there is no way. That story typically exemplifies that statement. There was no way for the people inside to eat. To the point that when even the prophet of God came to tell the king that by this time of tomorrow, such a wonderful thing will happen that the man that leans close to the king said, if even God opens the gate of heaven, it cannot happen. And the prophet said, it will happen because God has said it. That's what makes me a prophet of God. But since you say it will not happen, you will see it, but you will not take part of it. And it happens to happen exactly as the prophet said. But the man that was against it or does not have faith to believe in it saw it, and while going towards it, he was trampled by the hearts of people, and he died, and he could not take partake of it. So God made a way for the people in the time of famine when they don't think there will be a way. God made a way for the lepers when it seems that there is no way. Do you remember what the lepers said? If we stay here, we are going to die. If we go there, we are going to die. Okay? Well, let us take our life in our hands. Let us go. And God made a way for them that the Assyrians have cleared out of the way. God has cleared the Assyrians out of the way for them to take their blessings. That is the first example that I want to give to you. Now, I recommended that you read 2 Kings chapter, chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. They are full of jewels to support this particular topic that I have chosen, God has given to me to talk to you about this morning. Now, we have talked about the first one. Let us go to the other one. So the second person we are going to talk about is Naaman. Naaman was a great man. He was a Roman, he was a, a, a general. But he was a leper. He has what you call Shubon, Ninu He was handsome, he was successful, but he was a leper. And that leprosy was not good. Then a maid in his house, who was happens to be an Israel, who happens to be an Israelite, suggested that if Naaman will go to the prophet in Israel, that through God, Naaman can be made whole again. And the suggestion was made to Naaman, and Naaman went to to, to the king of Syria, who gave him a letter to the king of Israel. And when the letter came to the king of Israel. The king of Israel read the letter and he tore his, his, he tore his clothes. He said, come and see oh, what this man is trying to do. He's trying to make war. He's trying to look for my trouble. Am I God that can heal a leper? So Elijah heard what the king has done. So Elijah sent for the king. He sent for, 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 to the king and told the king, send for Naaman to come to me that Naaman would know that there is a prophet and God in Israel. So Naaman went to Elisha. Elisha did not even appear to him, just told him. As he comes, he told his servant, tell him to go to the river Jordan and take his bath seven times. Ori knew how the bath of the jail. Naaman refused. He got hungry. I am a big man. Are there no rivers in Syria? Is this river and that river not even better than the Jordan? The man didn't even appear to me. He didn't even come to see me. I'm going home. And as he began to go home, one of his soldiers called him aside and said, My Lord, if the prophet had told you to build a temple, you will build it, right? If the prophet had asked you to do other things, you will do it. 
They simply ask you to go to the Jordan and take your bath. Why don't you just go ahead and do it? And he responded, I went to the Jordan and took his bath seven times. And the leprosy was removed from him. God made a way where there seems to be no way for Naaman. He made it for him. He's still making ways. And God will make a way for us where there seems to be no way. God will break down our breakthrough God or break out God. We break out every barriers in our lives and we shall receive our destinies in Jesus' name. Wherever the enemies have put the limits of our destiny, where we can rise up to, God will break it through and we, can, we are going to rise higher than that in the name of Jesus. Another example, the Acts. Now this concerns the, 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 the sons of the prophets. So they wanted, the place they were using became too small and they wanted to have another place. So they told the prophets and they even asked the prophet to go with them. And the prophet went with them. And as they got to this place, they have to fell woods so that they can get woods to build what they want to build. But as they were cutting woods, the head of the, the axe fell into the water. And the son of the prophet said, Alas, we borrowed the axe. What are we going to tell the person we borrowed it from? It has to be returned. You see, one thing from that story is that when we borrow something, we must give it back to the person who has lent it to us. The Bible says in the book of Psalm 37, the wicked borrows and never return. But these ones are not wicked people. They are the sons of the prophets. So when they make this exclamation that it has to be returned, and they cry to Elisha, Elisha said, where, where, where did it fall? And they showed it to him. Elisha said, give me a stick, and they give it to him. He put the stick in the water. And as he touched the water, the head of the ass floats. It was a miracle. Ass is made of iron, and it's very heavy. And by the law of gravity, heavier things sinks, lighter things float. The fact that the ass was able to float happens to be a defiance of the law of God. And when, it, when anything defies the law of God, we call it a miracle. And it was a miracle. Again, God has shown that he will make a way where there is no way. There is no way they could have gone into the river to look for the axe to bring it back up. And even if there had been a way, it would have been a difficult one. And the prophet of God simply put a stick on top of the water, not to look for the axe, but as soon as the stick touches the water, the axe itself came up and it was picked and returned. Praise the Lord. Another example. The mountain of fire, <laughs> it has to do with Elisha and, the, and his protege, the, the young guy that is learning under him, his servants. Now, whenever the king of Assyria made a plan, Elisha, through the spirit of God, knows it and tells the king, king, don't go to that place. The enemies are coming there. So when the enemies get there, the king, they didn't find the, the king there. And the king said, who among you is a traitor? You among my people. Who among you is a traitor? Everything I try to do, the king seemed to know. And one of them answered and said, none of us is a traitor. None of us is betraying you. The problem is Elisha. Everything even that you do in your own bedroom, Elisha knows through the spirit of God. And the king said, well, if we have to succeed, we must kill Elisha or have him arrested. So he sent soldiers to surround Elisha's place so that they can have him arrested or killed. And Elisha was sleeping comfortably. So in the morning when they came out of the door, the servant of Elisha saw the host of the Syrian army surrounding them. He was afraid because he, he knows that they don't mean well. So he went and told Elisha, look, we have a host of army surrounding us. Elisha said, don't worry. The people that are with us are more than they that were with them. 
And the boy looked at Elisha. Baba, have you been smoking camel dunk? There is no people around us. It's you and I. But there is serious soldiers all over the place. Elisha said, you don't know. Okay, God, please open his eyes. Let him see what is happening around him. And then when God opened his, his servant's eye, he saw a mountain around him. The mountain was, original, it was a spiritual mountain, but now it has been made physical because the servant has been put in, in, in the spiritual world. So he saw the mountain. He saw chariots of fire. He saw horses. He saw soldiers all around them. And those that were around Elijah to guide him and protect him were more than even the Assyrians have brought. And there was even no need for that mighty. God just wanted to show us what he's doing around us. Because one angel of God slew 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. But God allowed us to see that he has a lot of people around us. Remember what Jesus said. Don't you know that I can call five legion, 12 legions of angels if I need one? There are angels around us. There are two worlds that we have. We have the physical world. In the physical world, physical people like you and I, and physical things like this chair and this church are there. But around us is a bigger world. It is a spiritual world. It is the world of the spirits. And in that spiritual world, there are people. There are wicked people. There are angels of God. And unless God opens your eyes or open your heart, because our hearts also have eyes, or our mind, which also have eyes, if God, if God opens it, we will be able to see all that is around us. So our God is a great God. He's a mighty God. He's an excellent God. He's a God of two worlds both the physical and the spiritual world. And the spiritual world is greater than the physical world. Anything that is going to happen in the physical world first happens in the spiritual world. So if you are defeated in the spiritual world, you will be defeated in the physical world. Everything that emanates, everything that affects us happens right there and then. And God was able to show that to us in this passage. Another passage, please. The widow and her son was another case, again in the same very few chapters, very few first seven chapters of the second kings. The widow and her son. This was a case of a widow. Well, a widow is a person that her husband has died, and the husband left many children with her. I was a case, this was not even a case of famine, but a case of wants and needs, as we were discussing in Sunday school. So there was need to pay those, this woman of own money. And there was a need also to feed themselves. And this needs, as God has promised, God will surely meet. And Elisha, when this woman complained to Elisha, our problem, so Elisha said, do you have bottles? Do you have anything? And, do you have, and the woman said, I have some oil. But I don't have bottles. Elijah said, gather as many bottles as you can. And as she gathered the bottles, Elijah increased the oil and the bottles were filled. Elijah, Elijah was one, one messenger in a way that happens to be like Jesus. He multiplies. God gave him the power to multiply. And the woman gathered bottles, everything from all her friends. And all the bottles were filled until she said there were no more bottles. And Elijah said, sell the oil, pay the debts, and feed yourself on the rest of them. And the woman did. It was a case of God again making a way where there seems to be no way. The woman's debts were paid, the children were fed, and everything was all right. Praise the Lord. Another example, please. The case of the Shunammite woman was a case of a person, and it teaches us to do good, especially to the, to, the, to the people of God, and to the servants of God, more especially. So this woman, every time he sees Elisha passing by, she felt in her heart that it, there's a need to provide a place that this man can rest while on this journey. And the woman asked her husband, and they agreed. And they built a place for Elisha that whenever he, has, he, he comes to that, she, uh, 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 we call the woman the Shunammite woman. 
Jesus referred to her in the New Testament also, which makes it a, a, a story that uh, uh, Jesus himself was very familiar with. And then having built the, build the house, the man resides there every time he comes. And then the man, in order to show his own gratefulness, because when you bless the people of God, God will bless you, said, woman, what do you need? What do you want? Do you want me to recommend you to the king? The woman said, I, I don't leave my own people. I live among my people. I don't need you to recommend it to the people. Actually, I don't need anything. God is good. It is well. The woman was the first one to say the, it is well in the Bible. It is a common phrase every one of us used today. It was taken from that place. And, El, and the servant of Elisha, Gehazi, told Elisha, oh, she, she, she. you know some people, they don't want to tell you their problem. This woman had a problem. She does not have any child. And Elisha called the woman, and the woman confirmed it. And Elisha said, by this time of next year, the time it takes for a woman to have a child, you will have a son. And it happened. You see, the, 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 the difference between a prophet, a prophet of God, and a non-prophet or a false prophet, is that when God says something, it happens. But when a person that is not a prophet of God says it, it may not happen or it doesn't happen. So the woman had the child. Again, an example of a story where God makes a way where there is no way. The woman had grown old too. She couldn't, she was barren, completely barren. And God made a way for this Shunammite woman to have a son. There was a problem with the son later, which the prophet also took, through the grace of God, took care of. But that is a story for another time. The story today is that God made a way for her. And the God that made a way for the Shunammite woman can make a way for a Nigerian man and a Nigerian woman. Praise the Lord. Yes, ma'am. The poison food, this was the case of the, the sons of God. They got to a place and they needed to make food. So they gather herbs and all kinds of things and put it in a pot. And by mistake, they gather a particular herb that happens to be poisonous. And as they put it in the pot and they cook the food and everybody began to take portion, they realized that the food was poisoned and they said, there is death in this pot. So they cried to Elisha and Elisha said they should do this and they should do that. And as they put that in the pot, the food, the poison was removed and everybody was able to eat comfortably. Again, hunger came. What was the blessing that was supposed to be a blessing became a poison. So the, may, the way was made, but was not the proper way. And again, by the power of God, it was corrected. Praise the Lord. Another example, ma'am. Ah, that is a story that we, are, we heard about in Genesis. Give us the references there. In Genesis 11, verse 26, that was the first time God mentioned Abraham. Yes, mentioned the next reference. In Genesis 25, verse 10, that was where Abraham died. The story of Abraham was told from Genesis 14 to Genesis 20, 25? Yes, to 10. This was the story of a man that was called out of his own place from among his own people to go into a land he has not been, to go to a place he has not heard of, to go and live among people he does not know. He was called to believe in a God that he cannot see. The people of his own place were worshiping moon. His family were worshiping moon and stars just like the Muslims today. But God saw in him that he hates those things and he has a desire to know him. So God revealed himself to him and told him, come and leave this place and go to a place I will show you. Abraham waited for the promise of God, for the way to be opened, for him to have a son for more than 25 years from the time we know him. He left the hall of the Chaldees in Mesopotamia. At the age of 75, he finally had a son that God promised him at the age of 100. His wife also being old, 
at the age of 90. That child was called Isaac, the promised child. God had promised Abraham, through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That is true. A particular descendant, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord, that will come through your line. All the families of the earth will be blessed. We are enjoying that promise today. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. But it took Abraham to wait for 25 years from when God called him to the age of 100 before he can have this promise fulfilled. But again, it's a very wonderful story. If you want to read about it, I've given you the reference. If you want to know about Abraham, go to Genesis chapter 14 and read up to Genesis chapter 25 where he died. Abraham died at a good old age with his two sons at that time and maybe the other six children from Keturah. Eight of them burying him. He was 175 years old. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The man that couldn't have a son had six, had eight. One from Ega, one from Sarah, and six from Keturah, making a total of eight children. God opened a way. God made a way for Abraham. Next example, please. Israel is a very big story. The story of Israel. You remember Israel? Jacob became Israel. Starting from the name Jacob, God was with him. Until God changed his name to Israel. And again, back to the story of Abraham. Abraham became Abraham. Sarai became Sarah, the mother of many. Abraham became the father of many. Sarah became the mother of many children also. And Jacob's name also was changed from Jacob, the supplanter, to Israel, the prince of God. Praise the Lord. And God was faithful to Israel. It's a long story, but it's a very beautiful story. Israel had to come out of Egypt after 430 years of being enslaved. Israel has grown from 70 or 75 people. The book of Genesis says 70, 70 people entered into Israel, into Egypt. But the, the book, the New Testament told us 75. There is no discrepancy there. Jo Joseph himself was already in Egypt. He had a wife and then he had two children. If we had that, it would be 20, 74. And maybe there would be another one. But whatever it is, very few people. The smallest nation in the world, 75 people, became almost 2 million or over 2 million people when they came out. And when they came out, it wasn't easy. It was by the mighty hand of God through Moses that God had to set him free. You remember what Pharaoh said? Who is this God that I should listen to him and let Israel go? And God said, I know. I made him specially for this purpose that my glory may be shown through him. And God performed wonders and miracles. Finally, they were let go. But as they were going, Pharaoh decided, ah, why did I make the mistake of letting them go? Go and bring them back. Let's go and bring them back. And as Israel was going, there was the Red Sea on the front and the Pharaoh's army behind. It was a dilemma. Front, you cannot go back. You cannot turn back to. And the Israelites were afraid. I said, Moses, what have you brought us out of this Egypt? Do you want, that there are no burial grounds in Egypt that you have taken us to this place? And he, Moses cried to God. And God said, why are you crying to me? What is in your hand? He said, the rod. Yes, yeah, stretch the rod to the sea. And the sea will part that Israel will go. And Moses told Israel, stand still and see the mighty hand of God. And he stretched the rod, and the Red Sea parted. And the road that was made there was not a narrow way, because to take 200 or over 2, mil, uh, to, to take two million people to cross that place in one night, that width must have been even more than a mile. It was separated very wide. Some have said 12 miles, but let us even say it is just one mile for them to be able to cross. Because mathematics, I mean, I'm a scientist, I'm a mathematician. There's no way it can, that place can be narrow and people can go through it in one night. 
But the Bible tells us by the, by, by the other day, the following day, they were already on the other side. Egypt, Egyptians were still in the middle. And Moses raised his staff again, and the sea covered them. This is a very wonderful case, showing that God will make a way, even in the midst of a mighty river, where there is no way. Praise the Lord. And that wasn't enough. Several times, God had to part the Jordan, even at the time when Jordan was the fullest, in order for them to cross into the Canaan land. Whatever is preventing you today, you and I, and God's people, that is preventing us to reach our glory, to cross into our destiny, into our promised land, God will make a way of escape for us. And we shall go through it, and we shall be victorious, and we shall glorify God in Jesus' name. Amen. Another example, please. In the book of Judges, Jephthah, this was a case, again, as God deals with nations, he deals with people. This was a young man. He grew up, he wasn't happy. Some of us are in that situation today. Not happy with the, our jobs, not happy with our friends, not happy with things around us. We have the power to change it. Don't take it lying down. Don't accept it. If anybody tells you to accept it, tell it, is a, it is a certain lie. Don't accept it. You have the power to change your life by calling on God. This is what Jephthah did. He told God, God, I am fed up with the way things are happening around me. I'm fed up with my life. I don't like the way my life is. I want you to expand my coast. And our merciful God listened to him. He hacking onto his voice and expanded his coast. Jephthah's life changed. In a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, he became what everybody desires. Praise the Lord. God made a way for Jephthah. God will make a way for you, Mr. Taiwo. God will make a way for you, Mr. Stephen. God will make for you for Deacon, Michael, every one of us, Taiwo, Sister Nike, every one of all our children, God will make a way for us in Jesus' name. No enemy shall limit how far we can go. They didn't make us. They didn't know when we were made. They don't know our God. And they don't know the limit of our God. God will raise us higher than any enemy proposed for any of us in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Another example. Hannah was another woman. This, was, this story was told in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Hannah was married to a man and she had the man had another wife. Hannah must be the senior wife because usually when a man has a wife that seems to be barren, either the family of the husband will start pushing him or the husband, too, will start wanting children. Anna could not have children. So every year, Anna will go to Chilo. The husband will take her there, will give, him, give her double portion, give the other children, give the wife. They will come back again. No child. The story tells us not to give up. When God delays, he's planning to give us better things that we are asking for. Praise the Lord. Is Samuel, the daughter of Anna, not greater than the children of Penina? Of course they are. He became the ruler and a judge in Israel, a prophet of God. Prophet that you will use to, to pray for other prophets. On this particular occasion, because Anna did not give up, she went to Shiloh. And said, this time I'm going to pour my heart, heart out to God. And she went down in prayer. Maybe voice was coming out initially. But he got a time, it was the heart that was speaking. It was at that time that Eli came and saw her. And said, what is wrong with you, you this common woman? You have been drinking again. And Anna said, my Lord prophet, I have not been drinking. This prayer I'm saying is the prayer that pains me in the heart. I'm asking for something that I, I really need. And I, Michael, in this case, she wants it. <laughs> so this is something I want. And this is why I'm talking to God from my heart. And the prophet said, let it be as you have asked. And she went on being happy. You see, 
When God says yes, don't go talking to another person. Yeah, don't go asking people to, 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 to pray for you, as our mommy testified here too. When God has spoken to you, and your spirit has confirmed it, and your spirit is at peace, then rejoice and rejoice. So Anna went home rejoicing, she was happy. And the following year, Anna had a son. They called him Samuel. And in order to pay a vow, and the one lesson about vow is this. God does not ask you to vow when you are asking for something from him. But if you do vow, the vow must be paid. A stupid person vows to God and refuses to pay. Don't vow, it's not necessary. But when you do, pay it. So Anna pledged to God, I will give this son back to you. And all the days of his life, he will serve you. Pastor has explained this story to us. Necessity meets need. <laughs> God needs a prophet to replace Eli and his sons. And the need of Anna met the necessity of God. And the prayer clenched. And Anna got his son. And she gave the son back to, to God to serve him. Again, what did God do? God made a way where there seems to be no way. Praise the Lord. Another example, please. David, huh, the mighty king of Israel. David was taken from the sheepfold. He wasn't the greatest of his father's son. He wasn't the firstborn. He wasn't more handsome than the firstborns. He was a rudy young boy. And God made a way of, for him to become the greatest king Israel ever had besides Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the king of Israel and the king of the whole world. David became the greatest king that Israel had. From the sheep coat, God took him. Rudy young boys of 17 years old or so, tending his farmer's sheep. The same thing with King Saul. He was looking for his father's donkey when he was taken to become the king of Israel. Our God can do great things with very little. Our God doesn't need many to fight his battle. God can win great battles with very few people. He did it with Gideon and 100 soldiers. Or 100 people. He did it with Abraham. With 319 people out of his household. They fought four kings. And they defeated them. Rescued Sodom and Gomorrah. Adma, Zoam, and the other cities. Praise the Lord. God can make a way for you. And for me. Yes? Bartholomew, the blind man. The story says that Bartholomew was blind from birth. He wasn't like Stevie Wonder. Stevie Wonder was born with sight, but he was still a little boy in an incubator so that they can, they, they, they can become, you know, well. And the oxygen in the incubator was too much. It was the oxygen in the incubator that blinded Stevie Wonder. Ray Charles became blind because of something in the air in his own time. They were able to have sight initially before they lost their sight. Bartholomew never had sight, never see anything. When his miracle came, he wasn't expecting it. Jesus took him, asked him to be brought to him. He made mud, spit into it. Rub his eyes, said, Go to the river Siloam, which is called Saint, and wash your eyes. And he came back seeing. God made a way, a sight for a blind man that was born blind. Praise the Lord. And of course, there are many stories of blind people also in the Bible that called Jesus the son of David. He said, Jesus. The son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And they told Jesus, if you will, you can make us 
well, can give us our sight. And Jesus said, receive your sight. The word went out. I shared the lay, And they received their sight. God made way for those who cannot see. God made way for lame people who cannot walk. And he made them to, to begin to start to dance. God made ways for the barren. That the barren, the barren bear seven. God can do it. That is the point I'm making to you this morning. Whatever the situation you think that you cannot get out of, God can make a way for you. Our pastor this morning said, our God is a breakthrough God. That is the first time I'm hearing somebody call him a breakthrough God. And I like it. From today, I'm going to call God a breakthrough God. God that can break through every barrier. He went into, when Paul was in prison, he went into prison and opened prison. When Paul and Silas were jailed, he came down in anger and the building shook and he broke the gate and he set all the prisoners free except they didn't, they didn't leave. Praise the Lord. Another example, please. Finally, our salvation. Praise the Lord. Ah, you didn't talk about the, the widow. You didn't talk about Joseph. They were there too. Maybe you were looking at time. Well, that's good. God make a way for the widow with the issue of blood. He had gone everywhere. He, he had hemorrhage. Her period never ceased to stop. And she went among the crowd when he heard Jesus was around. And he said, if only I can touch his garment. I don't have to talk to him. I don't have to see him. He doesn't have to say anything to me. If only I can touch the hem of his garment. I know this issue of blood will stop. And she got close enough to do so. And the hemorrhage stopped. But Jesus felt power going out of him. And Jesus said, who touched me? Who touched me? And the disciples said, Lord, what is wrong with you? Don't you see this whole crowd pushing here and there? And who do you think they, they are trying to, to, to get to? And you say, somebody touched me. And Jesus said, I know that somebody touched me for a purpose because power had gone out of me. It was then that the woman knew that the secret is not hidden. And she came out and said, I touched you. And Jesus said, go, my daughter. Your faith has made you whole. Praise the Lord. Our mother did not talk about Joseph. This, case, this is the case of a young man that God make a way for. His story was particular because when he was very early, in his very early age, he kept dreaming of God wants to do for him in the future. And the enemy stood against him. And they said, we will come to us. After they put him in the, in, in the well, they tried to kill him. And then they sold him to the Midianites. He said, we will now see what God can do for you with your dream, you dreamer. And God made a way for him in Pharaoh in Egypt, out of Pharaoh's house, out of the prison of Egypt, he became the prime minister of the whole world. Praise the Lord. God who raises Joseph from being a servant, from being a prisoner, into being a prime minister can do it for you. He will do it for you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Finally, mommy said, what about our salvation? And that is the greatest way that God has made for us. God has purpose to have us for himself. God called us his own inheritance in this world. And we also say to God, God, you are our own inheritance. You are the one that means everything to us. The houses we build don't mean anything. The children we, you gave us, we thank you for them, but they are not as precious as you are. You gave us beautiful women, wives, wonderful friends, and so forth and so on. You gave us education, you gave us everything. You even gave us a country, but they are not enough. You, God, you are the best. You are inheritance in the world. And Satan said, well, God, if I can't have these people, you will not have them either. We are all going to go to hell together. We are going to hell together, Satan said. And God said, I will make a way for them. And the way that God made for us is Jesus Christ. Jesus confirmed it in the book of John chapter 14, verse 6. He said, I am the way, 
I am the truth and I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. It wasn't a way that was easy. When God created the world, he created it with his voice. God made sound and things came from things we cannot see into things we can see. But when God made salvation for us, it cost him his blood and it cost him his life. But the important thing and the most important thing really is that God made a way of escape for us. A way, he closed the way to, to, to hell. Making a way of escape for us to be with him in heaven. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you will be also. By the grace of God, by the work that Jesus has done, none of us will perish in Jesus' name. We will not be cast away. Jesus has done the work. It wasn't an easy job for him. He did it. He said on the cross, it is finished. No other sacrifice is needed. No other thing can be done. It is finished. All we have to do now is to just believe. And as we believe, we must be in holiness. And we must embrace righteousness. There are two righteousnesses. There is the righteousness that Jesus and God imputes on us. And there is the righteousness that God also wants us to attain. By the way, we live our life. So let us embrace holiness and let us embrace righteousness. We will not miss the way. As Paul prayed, I have preached to many and for the purpose of even saving a few, I will do anything and I've done everything I can do. For I do not want the blood of anybody to be counted upon me. But Father, at the end of it all, let me not be a castaway. We will not be cast away in Jesus' name.